Okay, I don't think he's going to talk about the uh, the CIA Tibetan program in this video, it seems. I, I, I Like, a lot of you said, oh, he's uh, uh, he's got Hasanabe head writers and whatnot, but I don't think so. The CIA Tibetan program was nearly a two decades long anti-Chinese covert operation that focused on Tibet, which consisted of political action, propaganda, paramilitary, and intelligence operations. Uh, none of this will probably come as a surprise to you uh, if you know how America operates. Um, so, you know, it, exactly. The fuck are the CIA doing there? Uh, excuse me. What do you think the CIA uh, is doing in Tibet? It's anti-China. It's anti-communist China. It's anti-communism. That's what the fuck they were doing there. Just like they were doing this exact same thing everywhere around the fucking planet. That's how it is. That's how it always has worked. And that's how it always will work. The goal of the program was to keep political concept of an autonomous Tibet alive within Tibet and among several foreign nations. Although it was formally assigned to the CIA, it was nevertheless closely coordinated with several other U.S. government agencies, such as the Department of State and the Department of Defense. Previous operations had aimed to strengthen various isolated Tibetan resistance groups, which eventually led to the creation of a paramilitary force on the Nepalese border, consisting of approximately 2,000 men. By February 1964, the projected annual cost for all the CIA Tibetan operations had exceeded $1.7 million. Now, let me tell you something. That's cookies. War on terror, $6 trillion, $7 trillion. Think about that. They could have been using a lot more funds, but I guess $1.7 million for the time, pretty good. The program ended after President Nixon visited China to establish, which is why Nixon is a, is a Maoist, as everyone uh, knows, famously. Uh, the based uh, Maoist third world, uh, Richard Nixon, went to China and established closer relations in 1972. And the Dalai Lama did not like uh, this decision and criticized it, saying it proved wholeheartedly that the U.S. never did it to help the people of Tibet. No shit. Hello. <sighs> in the fields of political action and propaganda, the CIA's Tibetan program was aimed at lessening the influence, capabilities, and territorial scope of the government of China, particularly in the United States' feared communist involvement in the region. A 1957 report on logistical issues indicated increasing trepidation that the Chinese would escalate their communist presence in Tibet. The spread of communism in the international community was a huge concern for the United States. The CIA considered China's interest in Tibet to be a threat for multiple re uh, reasons. A 1950 memorandum noted that some of the reasons stem from a notion of bolstered sovereignty and a motivation to forge a bulwark against a possible invasion by Western powers in India. However, they also believed that China would use Tibet as a base of attacks against India and the Middle East in the Third World War. Therefore, intelligence officials declared action as a preventative measure should their worst case were, uh, scenario, World War III, unfold. St. Circus was the cover name for the training of Tibetan guerrillas on the island of Saipan at, and at Camp Hale in Colorado. St. Barnum was a cover name for airlifting of CIA agents, military supplies, and support equipment to Tibet. St. Bailey was a cover name for a classified propaganda campaign. Chinese-Indian relations also played an important role in framing the CIA's operations. Due to Tibet's geographic location between the two countries, it was strategically important. The CIA released numerous reports assessing relations. Now, the reason why we know this is because the CIA oftentimes, what I like to call uh, is a flex, will release this stuff later down the line. Like, they literally will, they, like, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years passes by. It's already done. They already did the propaganda. It's already solidified. It's made permanent. And then people, like, basically, intrinsically, in their fucking hearts are like, no, this is my real thing. This is my shit. I want to fucking fight it. They've already done it. Like, they, like, and there's also, obviously, legitimate need and interest in emancipation as well on the ground. That always, that always happens. No country is monolithic in that regard. Some people are going to be like, no, this is good. This is better for prosperity. Other people, uh, perhaps even a larger group of people are going to be like, fuck that. I don't want that shit at all. Okay? How? Although, having said that, in many respects, when you're looking at American involvement in color revolutions around the world, what you always should try to factor in is the voice of the voiceless. Because, whether you agree with it or not, historically speaking, given the fact that all of the peasants, serfs, slaves have oftentimes been armed 
in their original fight for emancipation for from colonialism, from dictatorships that are backed by the um uh by the western world, those guys don't get a lot of play in the motherfucking western media. No one ever goes up to a chavista and asks them how they feel about the literacy rates or the fact that they have fucking hospitals in their uh, farmland uh, rather than, uh, you know, they go to the fucking Chamber of Commerce. Oftentimes, these guys are already involved with the West because they're business leaders and they fucking talk to the media regularly and are directly involved with the State Department. Sometimes in the uh, sometimes when we talk about, for example... Um, especially as it pertains to like Venezuela, they will literally put the head of the Chamber of Commerce in uh, in a position of power immediately after trying to do a fucking coup d'etat like they did in Venezuela. One of many uh, examples. Just one. Just simply one. Okay? So that is something that you always have to understand. You can make up your mind on it on your own. I don't uh, uh, personally have a stake in this or a dog in the fight. I'm just simply giving you what I have seen time and time again through uh, everything that I have read, okay? Uh, it's always, it always fucking works like this. There is always, uh, there's always plenty of people that you can go and talk to, but the voiceless people oftentimes, the ones that are no longer slaves or serfs or, uh, uh, or, or liberated through, you know, violent revolution in many respects, those guys don't ever get heard. You only hear about, you know, the guys who lost their property. Now, what do I mean by that? We have an identical circumstance domestically that we can point to, okay? Look no further than the motherfucking South. America was built domestically under the same exact fucking principles. Literally look to the way that slavery is covered in the South and how that emancipation, that movement, okay, and, and how it was received in the Reconstruction era and, and why it wasn't perfect and they didn't go far enough, how the federal government fucked up and didn't go far enough, have, you know, has, has created these contemporary problems. You don't hear about the perspective of the freed men and women. You hear about the perspective, in a lot of instances, okay, of the slave owners and how their lives were uprooted and how devastating that was. The war of northern aggression. So just understand. I'm not saying this to be like, this is directly analogous to the Tibet and it's actually good and that like, uh, you know, uh, China is it did great things in Tibet overall. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just simply stating that um, covering affairs like this from an entirely one-sided perspective, okay, uh, is is not ever going to be good. But also, there are certain there are certain things that you can always point to. One simple trick is look to who was liberated and how. When you want to understand that, okay, when you want to understand like whether or not the material conditions are better off after uh, this subsequent invasion, okay. Another thing that you can always look to, who stands to gain from uh, whatever kind of like counter-revolutionary movement. Another thing that you can always look to is, is not the reception of uh, said actions from uh, the Western media. But um, I guess, I mean, I don't know how to describe it. Huh. <sighs> Hassan, this isn't the take you think it is. What? What do you mean? Oh, one final aspect of this, and this is actually this is actually super critical of, you know, the Chinese government, just like I'm very critical of the American government. One thing that you should always never forget is that Big governments will do big government shit. What do I mean by that? States are always going to enact violent principles, okay? States will always be violent. State violence is considered the norm. That's why you say non-state actors, you call non-state actors terrorists, right? It's a different classification. Violent paramilitaries 
acting at the behest of or acting against the state are considered terrorists. It's a subclassification. If you if a cop throws a a uh, you know tear gas at you, that's not considered an act of violence because the state has a monopoly on violence. If you kick the tear gas canister back, or if you use a leaf blower against that tear gas canister, you have now engaged in an act of violence against the state. So never forget that. Now, what I mean by that is, is the Chinese government always going to fucking behave in a violent way whenever they're engaging in acts of, in their opinion, liberty? Of course. Of course they are. And they always will. That's, that's just how it goes. That's how big government works. It's just... What is the purpose of said violence? What are the outcomes of said violence? And whether or not we are looking at this through the lens of, of um, you know, whether or not we're looking at this through an objective lens. So when I talk about, like, even contemporary history, I'm giving you the details. You can make up your own mind on it, okay? But there's always still going to be a lot of violent actions that the state has engaged in. Remember, the, the Chinese government in that situation, okay, certainly, certainly was engaging in violent acts. Anyway. <sighs> Let's continue. CIA monitored the relations. The CIA worked to strengthen the Tibetans against the Chinese communist efforts. To do so, the United States planned to asylum to issue asylum to the Dalai Lama and his supporters. Some resistance fighters took their own lives when captured by the Chinese to avoid torture. The Tibetan resistance was prom promised weaponry and resources from the West to continue their resistance against the Chinese. Knowing resistance was unlikely to succeed, they accepted Chinese annexation. Okay? Here is Vince Bevins, uh, uh, the author of uh, the famous book, The Jakarta Method. Okay. This is George Kennan, one of the architects of this Cold War. Furthermore, we have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of the population. This disparity is particularly great as between ourselves and the peoples of Asia. In this situation, we cannot fail to be object the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in, coming, in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity without positive detriment to our national security. To do so, we will have to dispense with all sentimentality and daydreaming, and our attention will have to be concentrated everywhere on our immediate national objectives. We need not deceive ourselves that we can afford today the luxury of altruism and world benefaction. That's the... This is, you know, I, admitting uh, that none of this is, none of American acts of international uh, intervention ever come uh, with altruistic desires, okay? It's basically to say, in order to secure America's position as the global dominant force, we have to be anywhere and everywhere at all times and we are not doing this out of the kindness of our hearts we are not doing this for any kind of like real purpose of emancipation okay it's just basically saying the quiet part out loud it's the thing that i say all the time and people get very mad at me when they misconstrue okay that's it 